All right. So um, we are in Judges chapter 14. We're willing, we'll, we'll finish chapter 14 today. Um, and picks up right where, where we left off. You may remember that last week there, there were two plot lines that converge here. And the plot lines were Samson wants to get married, even though his parents don't approve. And the other is he fought a lion. <laughs> you know, those are, that's kind of cool. Don't want to leave that detail out. And that, that tale with the lion actually tells us a lot about the sort of man Samson is. And this first narrative is our introduction to Samson. Um, chapter 13 set us up to think that Samson was going to be different. And right from the beginning, chapter 14, we discover, no, he's going to be like all the other judges. In fact, he's probably going to be a little worse in many ways. So uh, we, we, we've talked about the engagement, all that sort of stuff. Um, and with that, uh, we'll start with... Uh, the feast in verses uh, 10 to, to 11. We'll start here. His father went down to the woman, and Samson prepared a feast there, for so the young men used to do. As soon as the people saw him, they brought 30 companions to be with him. Now, scholars pretty much agree that what is being described here is the pre-wedding party. Now, the way we do weddings is, is we have a wedding ceremony followed by a reception. And some receptions are more elaborate than others. Some weddings are more elaborate than others. Um, we had our reception in the fellowship hall of the church we got married at, church that I grew up in and met my wife at. Um, others, um, you know, you may have the wedding here and the reception elsewhere. It's designed for a large venue, inside, outside. The ancient world, particularly in um, Canaan at this time, it was the, the reverse. You would actually have, to use our lingo, a reception before the wedding, and then you would have the wedding ceremony, which ended with the consummation of, of, of the marriage. So, so uh, consummating a marriage was, was the actual marriage, if, if that makes sense. At that point, you were married. Um, and, and so that's why you, you have the party beforehand. Um, and this lasts for seven days, which would have been pretty normal at this time. And so... Uh, we, we weren't told specifically, but rather were shown that this, this is the case, that even though the parents didn't approve of the girl Samson chose for himself, which did not happen, you know, very rarely happened, uh, they apparently gave in. They gave in to their son saying, fine, you know. Um, and the irony is Samson's going to do the same thing uh, with, with his bride. So he is planning this feast. Now, um, uh, this feast took place at the bride's home, so he's, he's going to, to her, her. So it's not where Samson grew up, it's where she grew up, Timnah. Now this word feast is an important word here because it tells us uh, quite a bit. Now when we think of feast, we, we think of you know, fried chicken and, and apple pie, of course, because we're Baptists. But, but this word implies within it alcohol consumption. In fact, often in the Bible, the word is translated as drink. Let me give you a few examples to show you I didn't make it up. Genesis 26. And Abimelech, that's the Egyptian pharaoh, made them a feast. They ate and drank. So you see what is associated with the feast. Here it's defined, eating and drinking. Uh, Ezra, they gave money also unto the masons and to the carpenters and meat. And this is the word translated feast in Judges 14. Drink. They gave them feast. Well, that doesn't make any sense. The word imp really implies drinking. Jeremiah 16, uh, I stole this from the King James, so uh, you shall not also go into the house of feasting uh, to sit with them to eat and drink. So the word feasting, even in English, implies eating and drinking. Here it's, it's, it's uh, the consumption of alcohol, and particularly drunkenness. And that is going to be important because I think the decision Samson makes initially is probably motivated by alcohol. Um, Daniel 1, uh, the prince of the eunuchs, you remember when, when Daniel doesn't like the diet he's being offered. Um, I fear the Lord, the king, my Lord, the king, who has appointed your, your meat and drink, right? And uh, that, that, that's, that's the word there. And you remember Daniel is saying, well, I don't, I don't want this sort of diet. It's not good for us. And a few verses later, um, the, he says the, uh, the wine that they should 
drink. There it is. And it's very clear you're drinking wine here. That, that's the word. Now, it's not always translated that, uh, but certainly it implies al uh, alcoholic beverage. Now, why is that important? It's important because Samson was supposed to, to stay away from that. Remember that the Nazarite vow, most, for the most part, had three, three, three vows with it. Um, uh, don't be around bodies, dead bodies. Uh, avoid drinking alcohol and don't cut your hair. Now, usually a Nazarite vow was a temporary vow. So in Acts, Paul shaves his head and, and he says for the next however many days, um, I'm going to take this vow, which means he, he will... Uh, um, he, he will refrain from, from those, those things. Man, my, I apologize for the stutter. Um, it makes you appreciate that I don't stutter as much when <laughs> I don't have this. Anyways, um, so, um, but Samson has it for his whole life. And so within this first chapter, you have him touching a dead body, the lion, which he scooped the honey out of, and then um, exported that uncleanness to his parents by sharing the honey with his parents without telling them where the honey came from. Now he is feasting and drinking um, with Philistines, which only adds to it. So we, the reader, were ready for Samson to come in here, guns a-blazing, just, I'm going to get rid of all, all the Philistines. What do we see him doing? Reveling with, with the Philistines. So instead of pushing them out, he's joining them. He's become one of them. He's marrying uh, a Philistine woman. He is carousing with them. He is... Outside of biology and ethnicity, he is a Philistine. He is morally, spiritually a Philistine. Um, and what's interesting is this time his parents are watching him violate his oath. He, he hid the violating of touching a dead body, but now his parents are right there. And, and they are witnessing this. Well, you see there, verse 11, the bride's family invite 30 guests to the feast. Now, by modern wedding, uh, this is a small wedding. <laughs> uh, every one of us have done this. Um, when you came to your wedding planning, you had this moment where, where you started making out the guest lists, and it kept growing and growing and growing and growing. And what does the groom have to say? I thought we were going to have a small wedding. Well, well, I can't forget my second cousin twice removed I haven't talked to since, since the 50s, right? I, you know, it, 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 every wedding's like that. Um, uh, one of the things I like to do with weddings, by the way, weddings are becoming so rare. Have you noticed all the bridal shops closing? No one's getting married anymore. You want to know how you're living in a post-Christian era? There's, there's a good sign. Uh, um, anyways, uh, uh, one of the things I like to do... Uh, on the wedding day is about an hour or so before the wedding, I track down the bride and I kick everybody out. And I say, how are you doing? Honestly, how are you doing? Every single one of them break down in tears. How do you brides remember that? You're so stressed out. Your bridesmaids, your mother, your groom's mother, everyone else is wearing you out with a thousand questions, a thousand suggestions. And then you start thinking, you, you, you had imagined what your, your wedding would day, and the wedding finally comes, and you're overwhelmed. You're overwhelmed. I, I encourage people, small weddings. If you want to have a good wedding, keep it small. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Ours wasn't massively big. Um, it, was, it was great. Uh, man, it was just gorgeous, and, and the reception was simple. Um, I don't normally go to receptions as a general rule as a minister, but... Um, um, but this is 30. Now, these are 30 guests of, of the bridal family. So the, in, the, 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 see, now I can't even think of the word. The, the, it looks like Samson is meeting these people for the first time, or really they are meeting him for the first time, right? And that's sort of important. You know, uh, it, there's probably brothers, friends, companions, neighborhood kids. They're like, who are you marrying? Oh, we gotta meet this cat, you know, and and so that may contribute to some of the nonsense that that goes on here, um, and so. Uh, but I do want you to notice this in verse eleven. Um, as soon as they saw him, uh, they brought thirty companions. Your translation may say young men. That phrase "young men" is rather omin. Um, I'm so sorry, ominous, because um, we would expect groomsmen there or a word like that, but it's young men. What sort of young men? Well, this word is used later to describe 
select warriors. Here it is, Judges 20. Uh, And people of Benjamin, this is the Civil War, mustered out of their cities on the day 26,000 young men who drew the sword, uh, so on and, and so forth. Here it is, chosen men, that's the language. 700 chosen men among these 700 chosen men. It's the same language used to describe these companions uh, for, for Samson. So, it isn't, so it, this, this, this isn't just um, uh, uh, cousins. The, these, are, these are dudes who, if you mess with our girl, we will throw down. Okay? We used to call those brothers, <laughs> you know, right? right? Like if you know, the, the boyfriend eventually has to meet the dad, that's tough enough. But if she has a bunch of brothers... Good luck, you know? Um, and that seems to be, so you got, her, got them set straight? Yeah, Did you pop a willy or anything for him? <laughs> uh, but all that is to say that everything about these first two verses, as we're getting ready for this wedding, is, is tragic. Uh, Samson has disregarded his vow. He's disregarded the will of his parents. He has chosen to marry a pagan, and now he is living and acting like a pagan. And as a narrative, the reader is wondering, how is the Lord going to deliver Israel this time? Because so far, the Israelites were at least enemies with the invaders and the oppressors. Now, they're friends. There is no indication that Samson wants to push the Philistines out. So how's he going to do it this time? Well, let's look at the, the wager. Okay, the wager, verses 12 to 18. Uh, it says there, uh, verse 12, Samson said to them, Let me now put a riddle to you, if you can tell me what it is within the seven days of the feast, and find it out, then I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. But if you cannot tell me what it is, then you shall give me 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. And they said to him, Put your riddle, that we may hear it. And he said to them, out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. And in three days, they could not solve the riddle. On the fourth day, uh, they said to Samson's wife, notice the language of wife, entice your husband to tell us what the riddle is, lest we burn you in your father's house with fire. Have you invited us here to impoverish us? And Samson's wife wept over him and said, you only hate me, you do not love me, you have put a riddle to my people, and you have not told me what it is. And he said to her, Behold, I have not told my father nor my mother. Shall I tell you? She wept before him the seven days that their feast lasted. And on the seventh day he told her, because she pressed him hard, and she told the riddle to her people. And the men of the city said to him, On the seventh day before the sun went down, What is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? Okay. Uh, oh, oh, we got to finish. Sorry. He said to them, If you had not plowed with my heifer, you shall not have found out my riddle. We will get to the heifer part in a minute. Hold, hold your horses. Um, So, you can see that the story implies not just that there is drinking, but Samson is perhaps chief among them. Because what he does here is pretty foolish. It's the sort of thing you would expect of an arrogant man intoxicated. Hey, 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 you know, hey, let's make a wager, (laughs) you know, and and it's a wager that neither one of them can afford to lose. Uh, This sort of thing intoxicated dumb men do. Uh, um, so we need to know that riddles were, were common forms of entertainment really up until some point in the 20th century. Uh, maybe, maybe you remember exchanging riddles or reading riddles or something like that. Um, uh, these, these are very common. I'm going to make my Lord of the Rings reference, so I'll put a dollar in, in the cup uh, at some point, a Monopoly dollar maybe. Um, in the book The Hobbit, which I actually like more than Lord of the Rings, the trilogy, in The Hobbit, the most famous scene is probably the chapter's called Riddles in the Dark. It's when Bilbo and meets Smeagol, Gollum, for the first time, and they exchange riddles, and, and that's when Bilbo gets the ring. If you've not read The Hobbit, then we're going to move on. Uh, it's a great scene. Even the movie, they nail it. It's a great scene. I, I love it. Um, um, it's, it's goofy and, and all that, um, and it moves the plot along. It's really good. Um, but then what came to mind was one of my favorite Batman villains, the Riddler. I love the Riddler. Um, uh, he's, he's goofy. Jim Carrey played the Riddler in the, in the 90s, and he played it the way you would imagine Jim Carrey playing that. You know, Think of uh, what, Ace Ventura meets uh, the Grinch <laughs> and, a, and a big green suit, so tight green suit at that. So, um, but the word riddle here, it can describe a riddle as we understand it, and that's a perfectly fine translation. Um, and that's how it's used in the text. But it's rarely translated that outside of chapter 14 as riddle. 
Now, if you take the usage in the Bible, it's mostly translated riddle, but it's only translated riddle in this chapter. So if you go outside of this chapter, it usually gets translated something else. Um, it describes an enigmatic sentence, a difficult question, a proverb, or even a dark saying or dark speech. So let me give you one example of this. Uh, when uh, the Queen of Sheba comes, she put to him hard questions. It's, this, it's the word here for riddle. That's what a riddle is. It's a, it's a tricky, it, proverbial, um, um, poetic you know, sort, sort of statement. Um, and his point is, is to trick or to get you to think. My son loved riddles, and I'm not very good at He would want me to make them up on the fly. And they had a rhyme, okay, because he's three or four. I'm like, oh, son, <laughs> I, I, you want me to rhyme? I'm not a rapper. Um, but nevertheless, uh, th- these would have been a uh, common form here. But more than seeing this as a riddle for entertainment, we need to see this as a wager, as a form of entertainment. Both sides have much to lose, um, and, and there is a hint of darkness behind it. Um, and so it, the purpose of the wager is to enrich Samson. What is described here as the fine linen cloths and clothes and all that seems to be uh, fashionable, expensive clothing. It describes the, 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 the inward cloak and the outward robe that the rich would wear. And so being that there's 30 companions, the issue is, is either all of you get one and bring it to me or that I have to get one for each of you. He is so confident he's willing to multiply their expense by 30, which is crazy town. I mean, and this is how he wants to start his, his marriage, gambling away everything. You know, and, and, and you can't you can't go you, you can't declare bankruptcy when you gamble like this. Okay, <laughs> they're going to get their money. They're going to get, get what they want. Um, and so his arrogance is really getting, getting the best of them. So notice what, what we've learned here. Um, oh, by the way, if, if you're wanting a biblical proof of garments here, here's one. Um, um, it's, it's the word for festal garments and we're expensive. Um, but, but what you have here is, so far we've learned he, he, he is enticed by women. He acts without thinking. He disregards the authority of parents. He is more of a Philistine than a Yahweh-worshipping Jew. This is the hero of Israel. So he, the lust of the eyes is all over him. He's greedy. He's lustful. This is your hero. So he wants the finer things of life. He wants women all around him. And he wants to manipulate and deceive the people people around him. He, he, this, <laughs> this is our hero. Um, so, um, so the riddle is verse 14. I, I don't want to spend a lot, of, a lot of time on this. Um, he puts a deadline on it, seven days. So he spends the whole reception, if you will, with, with this uh, going on. And um, I think we know what the riddle is. The answer is because we've, we read the story earlier in chapter 14. And so I don't want to spend a lot, a lot of time on that. So in their panic, three days into, they're about halfway through, and they're starting to panic, right, as, as we would. They, they, they don't want to have to, to pay up. And so they come up with a plan. You'll notice there in verse 15, my Bible says on the fourth day. Does anyone have anything different? So you got King James or New King James? New King James? What, Danny, what translation you got? You got New King James too? Okay. So, you guys, what do you have? You have, you have ESV? You should have a footnote, right? So, it should say on the fourth day you have a footnote that says Septuagint, Syriac, Hebrew, Seventh. So, did it, uh, it says Seventh on the Pew Bible. Does it have a footnote It says Fourth? In the footnote? Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. So you can see that you have two options. Either it's the fourth day or the seventh day. And this is a, this is a manuscript issue. So all your older translations uh, of, of the 16th century, 16th, 17th century, so this would be the Geneva Bible, Bishop's Bible, uh, uh, Matthew's Bible, Cloverdale, uh, Cloverdale, and the King James all have seventh, and New King James, because it's obviously based, it's a newer version of King James. Your more recent translation, New American Standard, NIV, ESV, all of them will, will say fourth. It is an issue of, of manuscripts. We cannot chase this rabbit. We can spend weeks on it if, if you're interested in this stuff. Um, uh, I'm interested in it because I'm a nerd. But, um, 
um, there's some discrepancy here. You can see why you would change it the fourth day, um, um, but, but regardless, the, you can see the numbers seem to be that for seven days this is going on. And that seems to be, if it is seven, that seems to be what it is. But I figure someone would, they would hear me read four and theirs would say seven. Note, we pointed this out earlier, uh, they call his bride wife, even though they more likely haven't consummated the marriage officially, um, which took place at, at, at the end of the wedding, of course. And this word entice, um, verse 15, entice your husband. Does anyone have a different translation? Uh, in the uh, message, mm-hmm. it doesn't call her his wife, it calls her his bride. Yeah. But then he calls him her husband. Really? Yeah. yeah, they need an editor, catch that. Um, I, like, I prefer the term bride here, um, and him a groom, but... But it's, it's okay. The, the, the text isn't being literal here. Um, because in the ancient world, they, they essentially were married outside of the actual seal of marriage, which was consummating the, the marriage. It also says, uh, worm the answer out of your Worm the answer. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah, I like that. That's, that's very vivid. Um, to go back to the husband-wife thing, uh, Mary and, remember that Joseph was going to divorce his wife? But they weren't married. They hadn't consummated. She was still a virgin. But, but the way it worked in Jesus' day is you, you have like an engagement period for about a year where you are considered husband and wife, but you haven't consummated. That happens at, after the wedding. So you would divorce your wife even though you weren't married, but you were married. It's a different way of approaching it than what we have. Um, Mm-hmm. Joseph, yeah. Yeah, they were husband and wife, but they weren't husband yeah, and wife. They weren't living to, yeah. Together yeah. Joseph would have probably still been building their home, and she would have uh, she would have uh, stayed with particularly her mother, but her under her father's care. Uh, so any final things they need to learn, you know, she's probably thirteen at the, at the time. So, um, but this word entice or worm, I like that. It means to open wide and is usually applied to the mouth. And, and it's actually how, how she, uh, the bride here entices. She entices verbally. She, she, she basically uh, emotionally manipulates Samson. This is her weapon. Um, they come to her and say, you need to entice him. You, you need to trick him. You need to deceive him. You, you need to... You need to force the answer from him. Now, here is a big, strong man. You know, I like to imagine him as six foot five, broad shoulders, ladies, right? I'm sure with the perfect jaw line and a deep voice, he could do a cover of Johnny Cash. You know, wherever, wherever he is. That's why I think of Samson. Like one of the novels, right? Yes, it's Fabio. Long hair, you know, blonde, of course. Huh? But he's sensitive. He writes poetry. Um, but uh, she knows that... that she can't, she can't get the answer from him physically, but she can manipulate him emotionally. And this is, this is the weapon that many uh, women will use against men. You remember what, what we've said, that in the Bible, women are often portrayed as being deceived, uh, which she has deceived here through threats to her and her family. We'll talk about that. But men are often uh, uh, portrayed as being seduced. And here the deception is through not physical seduction, but emotional seduction. Um, this is how they start their marriage. Of course, they don't get married. We'll, we'll see uh, at the end. Um, now, what's interesting, there's irony here, is she does this to protect her family from 30 men. The irony is, of course, she's about to marry a dude who can take on 30 men. In fact, in chapter 15, he gets the jawbone of a donkey, and he, just, he, he goes all WrestleMania. But real, (laughs) you know, he he really does it. Now, why doesn't she know that? Well, we've seen in chapter 14, he killed a lion and told no one. And instead of telling someone what he can do, he uses those skills to manipulate others for his benefit. So notice what you have this triangle is, he is secretive to be deceptive. And when he is successful at deceiving the 30 companions, who themselves are mighty warriors, likely, or something like that, 
they then deceive his bride to manipulate her to get their way. She then, to protect others, has to manipulate Samson to get her way. Then what does he have to do? At the end, he has to go and go kill 30 Philistines. When if they just talked <laughs> and, and then they let go of this corruption and wickedness, and he didn't have to come into the town and say, hey, guys, guess what? Come here, come here, come here, come here. I killed a lion. I'm better than you. But that seems like important information to have. You guys have a lion problem. I'm looking for a job. So that when she is threatened, it's noteworthy. Her first thought is not, tell my husband or groom. It's, deceive my groom. This is not going to be a good marriage. You do not need a degree in counseling to, to see this. And so what does she do? She weaponizes her emotions knowing that though this man is strong, he's really weak. He's really weak. And this is a weapon that women will use against many men. You're not allowed to say that because that's sexist, but it's true. And why does it work? Why does manipulation work? It's because men cannot win. So put yourself in Samson's shoes. He has two options whenever you're being emotionally manipulated. Two options. One is you turn into a dude and you defend yourself. You can't do that because now men will turn against you. That's evil, wicked. Or you can give in and now you're weak. So you can't go to the, the direction of strength. You can't go in the direction of weak. You lose either way. And wicked women know this. They know this. They manipulate emotionally or sexually or other means. And she is, is, is manipulating him, him emotionally. Um, if you wanted to see him take on the, the, the Philistines with the donkey job on chapter 15, verses 4 to 6, but we'll, we'll move on. Um, so you'll notice verse 16 to 17, she, she cries every night. She accuses him, verse 16, of hate. He justifies his secrecy. Uh, so he, he's not innocent in this. Uh, he justifies his secrecy. Uh, why would he tell her, let alone her guests, when he hasn't told his own parents? Wh of which she should say, hold on a minute. You would hide things like this from your own parents? You're hiding them from me. We got a problem here. Red flag. <laughs> this is a red flag. You know, this guy's hiding things, and which tells me he's been lying to me. Now, they, they met like a week ago, so uh, I'm sure there's a lot of things she, she doesn't know. Um, and what does she do? She keeps crying, verse 17, throughout the entire feasts. So you try to have a wedding. Let's say it's, it's the bachelor and bachelorette party. It lasts for a week, okay? Everyone's together. You're going to do everything together. And the whole time, she doesn't look at him. She doesn't want to talk to him. She turns her back on him. And the only time that she'll get a message to him is one of her girlfriends will go over there, and she will let him know she's mad. So he'll go over there and say, hey, what's going on? It's supposed to be our wedding. Well, I'll tell you what it is. And she will berate and she will emotionally manipulate him. And he's like, well, I can't win. I can't win. I can't win. I kill a lion, but I can't handle this. It's, it's, it, this, this is everyday life. This is everyday life that goes on in many of our marriages. Um, uh, so what does he do? He gives in. He can be aggressive with men, but he knows he cannot be aggressive with women. That's good. But what other option does he have? It is to unveil that he is a weak man, which affects his ability to lead in his own home. So he just tells her. And what does she do? She does the things a wife shouldn't do. She betrays his trust. Now, she's been betraying that trust by manipulating him, but she betrays his trust by giving the answer to, 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 to the companions. And so what happens is they answer it, what is sweeter than honey, what is stronger than lion. And what does he say? He says, well, here's, here's a poem for you. If you had not plowed with my heifer, that is the Hebrew, that's a perfectly fine translation, you would not have found out my riddle. Now, as a general rule, you should not compare your wife to a heifer. <laughs> is that a too obvious of an application to this text? I was thinking about this this, this week. Um, uh, studying this. What's that? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to tell Kent that. I'm going to tell Kent that. You know, what I actually did is I try to find if in Song of Solomon 
the bride is ever compared to heifer. She ain't. She's a goat, <laughs> you know, like, like, not a heifer, never a heifer. You know, so like, well, that's clear. So when I was a youth pastor, my pastor, and I still consider my pastor, is, is uh, his big thing in marriage was never call your wife woman. You've probably heard that. Woman, we got to go, right? He just, he would just berate men for that. I mean, you just, you just don't, you don't do that. And I thought, I wonder what he would say about heifer. <laughs> that's right. I thought, like, he, he called his bride a heifer. Uh, that, that's true. Uh. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so why are you divorced? Call me heifer. Okay. That may be the, the extra reason that Jesus gives. We just don't have the revelation of that um, for, for divorce. Now, you can see his point here is, is he is expressing betrayal. This is his wedding, by the way. Well, that heifer of a wife I'm about to marry did this. This is not going to be a good marriage. Not at all. Um, now, the Hebrew word, what's interesting, the Hebrew word for heifer is similar to the Hebrew word for the name Eglon. That, is, that may ring a bell. Eglon was the king that got stabbed by Ehud in chapter 3. Remember the left-handed dude who went in, snuck in because he's left-handed, and he stabbed him, and his guards thought he was using the restroom, and so he was able to sneak off where he rounded up the troops and went to war while they were scrambling without a king. So it's interesting, is, is one of the first judges we have, Ehud, wars against a heifer. And the last judge we have of the main judges calls his wife a heifer because he's having to go to war with her. It's just, just interesting parallels the way this works. It's almost like it's, it's on purpose and God knows what he's doing. However, calling her a heifer, um, what he's saying is um, she is stubborn and untamed. Don't do that. <laughs> so let me prove this to you biblically. Jeremiah 50. This is God speaking of Israel. Though you rejoice, though you exult, O plunderers of my heritage, though you frolic like a heifer in the pasture, and nay, like stallions. You see, you're, you're untamed. You're stubborn. Uh, Hosea 4. And of course, Hosea, where he marries the, the harlot, and she, she runs off all that. Like a stubborn heifer, Israel is stubborn. Um, so so you, you, this is language that would have been common in, in, in the ancient Israel f- for this. Um, now, I'm not a marriage expert. I've done a lot of counseling and marriages and relationships and stuff. Um, this would be an easy case to diagnose. Your marriage is not going to last. Not going to last. Um, they are a mess. But what do you expect? What do you expect from pagans? Godless pagans. And by the way, this isn't the end of it. On the eve of his wedding, he's got to go kill a bunch of people in cold blood. So you can take the Ten Commandments <laughs> and say, give me a story where virtually all of them are broken by a man chosen by God to deliver Israel. Turn to chapter 14 of Judges, you're going to see it. It's, it's an incredible story. So let's look at that, the violence, and we, we really got to go. The violence, verse 19 and 20, and we're done. The Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. He went down to Ashkelon and struck down 30 men of the town and took their spoil and gave uh, the garments to those who had told the riddle. In hot anger, he went back to his father's house. Samson's wife was given to his companion, his best man, your translation may say, who had been his, his, his best man. All right, so second time we see the phrase Spirit of the Lord. Um, or second time we've seen it with Samson. We saw that uh, last week earlier. He goes to Ashkelon. This is a 23-mile uh, southwest of Timnah. So, so he's going farther away from his home, deeper into Philistine territory. Um, this is not just any city. It's not like he, he, he thought, okay, I'm going to throw a dart at a map, and that's where I'm going to kill a bunch of people. It goes to Ashkelon. Why is that important? The Philistines had five major cities. Um, one of them is Ashkelon. So this is an influential city. He's going to go in, uh, and he's, he's going to... He's going to Hulk Hogan the place, and, he, and he's going to get out, uh, and he's going to bring, bring this. So he's, he's going to target the wealthy. He's going to murder and steal, and he's going to bring it back and, and, and enrich the Philistines. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, you're going back up to verse 4. It's, it's, yeah. Verse 4 is probably one of the most key verses in the story of Samson.
It's similar to the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. The text says that God hardened his heart. The text says Pharaoh hardened his heart. Which one is it? It's yes. Yes. Um, but what you have is, is that God is sovereign over these conditions, though Samson is responsible for his wickedness. But God isn't limited by his wickedness to achieve what it is God ultimately wants to achieve through Samson, which is good news, that God can achieve good ends even through the wicked. That's not the way it ought to be done. Cyrus is the classic example of that. But you can look at virtually every character in the Bible, and that's what he does. Now, um, and Samson is a classic example. So um, that phrase, Spirit of the Lord, was also used of Jephthah. Um, and it was in the context of him making that foolish vow. So here you have Jephthah making a foolish vow regarding his daughter. Samson's making a foolish vow uh, that affects his wife. And the Spirit of the Lord is said to be involved in both. Now remember that God is going to get rid of the Philistines. And this is one of the ways in which he does it. Yeah, so now, now you're introduced to the Divine Council stuff, which, which would be a huge rabbit trail. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So those five cities, in case you want to know, Ashdod, Ashkelon, Akron, Gath, and Gaza. Remember, Goliath is from, is, is from Gath. He struck down 30 men, verse uh, 19, so he kills them. Um, this, again, demonstrates that had the bride known... He could have taken on the, the 30 companions who threatened her and her family. Uh, and verse, verse 19, just, just, what does he do? In hot anger, where does he go? Goes back home. Why? He cannot trust his wife. So, here is a man with peak emotion. And ladies, what do you want from your man is to open up, but he can't. Why? His emotions have been weaponized against him by the woman who's supposed to love him. So I'm going to get in trouble here, but I'm right. I'm going to say something all these men want to, have been wanting to say. One of the reasons men do not open up is because when they have... It has been used against them. Or it has been misinterpreted in such a way that they now have to apologize. What is Samson doing? My emotions have been manipulated. She betrayed me. He cannot go home to her. So he goes to mom and dad. Now mom and dad need to say, now, I know they're not married, it's, it's a mess, but they should be able to say, why are you here? Fought with my wife. So why are you here? Go work it out. Now, there may be context, particularly of safety, that may be different. But here, oh, you got in a fight. Welcome to marriage. Go work it out. Now, the crazy part is verse 20. <laughs> Just, so while he's away sulking, he's such a whiny baby, Samson's wife was given by her parents to his best man. And guess what Samson does? Chapter 15, he goes to get his wife and discovers she's already married. This is the one God consecrated from the womb. Isn't it good news to know? that God is not limited by mankind. That is good. Remember that when you turn on your news? There's an election coming up. There, there, there's a lot, lot of messy things going on right now. God is not limited by the wickedness of man to achieve his good end, including among the people of God. This is why we shouldn't give up on the church. Well, um, let me give two points of application. We're done. Number one, um, the story shows how are humans in general and men in particular weak. So mankind has conquered nature uh, and, and much of the animal world. We can travel to other planets. 
We cannot contain ourselves. We cannot control ourselves. Isn't that incredible? You've heard me say this before. We have, we have been good at addressing external problems. We are not freezing or hot right now. We, we have shelter, and it's insulated, and we don't worry too much when storms come. Uh, we're not too worried about disease. My son is sick, and you do not ask, is he going to survive? If he had an infection, you're not going to ask, will he live? No. no we've, what we've done with our external problems is incredible. They want to ride on your motorcycle. Yeah. But, but what we cannot do very well is the internal. Um, and we've already talked about where men, men are, are, are weak here. Men can go to work and they can fight and they can go and they can do all that. They cannot do that when they come home. They cannot do that. I bet a lot of wives have complained about men, seem, their husbands seem like they shut down when they come home. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I recommend, particularly young wives, give your husband 30 minutes when he comes home from work. Don't bother him. Not, not with a honeydew list, not with what are we going to do. Uh, you won't believe what Johnny did at work. No, 30 minutes, let him decompress. Uh, actually, a lot of men, if, if they have a long drive home for work, it's really good for them um, for this reason. Secondly, uh, there are many ways to, to manipulate. Notice, Samson manipulates through deception in the form of riddle. The Philistines manipulate through violence. They threaten the bride and her family. And the bride manipulates through emotional sabotage. This is the way humans interact with each other. And this story is a, is a great illustration of actually what we do to each other. It's pretty ugly. And hopefully we can start to see it. Not just that I'm being manipulated or this other person manipulates others, but that I'm guilty of this. Often I, I think, I think I'm, I'm, I'm doing it for right reasons, but in reality I'm being manipulative because I want what I want and I will manipulate to get it. I will withhold. I will make promises. I will do this or that. And this story really shows us just how common this is. All right, Danny, we miss anything? If only, she, if only she knew a man who could take on 30 men all by himself. Yep. Yeah, yeah. He should have shared about the lion. I mean, you talk about a first date conversation. I'd bring that up, wouldn't you? Like, don't worry about it. I killed a lion. In fact, I'll take you to go look at it. I brought you honey, honey. You know, like, like that, that's right at the beginning. I'll mention the lion. Out of your <laughs> it's before my time. I think the kids are ready to go. They want to go on that motorcycle. How about we pray? Danny, you got out at Sunday and Monday. You knew it's coming.